Dr. Alfred Sommer is best known for his landmark discovery of vitamin A deficiency related blindness and his efforts in worldwide eradication of the smallpox virus. This last Gur Award winner recently spoke with Richard Cohen on his life's work and his views on the role of public health. We should start by having you tell us really what the stakes were, or the human stakes with vitamin A. Uh, we had originally gone into this vitamin A deficiency issue because I'm an ophthalmologist by training. And so I was concerned about the impact of vitamin A deficiency on eye disease because we already had a fair amount of evidence that this might be a major problem in the developing world. And then quite by accident, we discovered as we went through our data and planned our studies and analyzed the results that it was having a very significant impact on childhood disease and childhood mortality rates. And now our estimates are that at its peak, probably one to one and a half million children were dying every single year uh, because they didn't have adequate vitamin A. And perhaps half a million children were going blind every year because they didn't have adequate vitamin now, A. Now, this were, this is measles related. Some of it was related to measles. Some was related to diarrhea. Some was related to general malnutrition. Measles was a, an important precipitating factor to make children who were on borderline vitamin A status suddenly had their vitamin A status dramatically depleted because of the metabolic burden of an acute attack of measles. So measles played a significant role, but by no means was it the only important role. Some kids went blind and died from vitamin A deficiency without any measles, the majority in fact. But if you had a single major cause that would precipitate acute deficiency, it would be measles. It's very common in uh, many traditional societies for night blindness, which is one of the early ocular manifestations of vitamin A deficiency, to be a common occurrence during the third trimester of pregnancy. People would accept night blindness as a normal part of pregnancy. And a lot of people laugh about that, but I remind them we accept, without any reason to accept it, that nausea and vomiting is a normal part of the first trimester of pregnancy. Well, there's no obvious reason why that ought to be a normal part of pregnancy here in the United States, so it's no more bizarre that people accept it as a normal part of pregnancy because it was so common, night blindness in women during their third trimester. How much of that is related to vitamin A? Relatively little. And the reason it's relatively little is that the children who go blind from vitamin A deficiency also die. So they're not there to be counted. It seems to me that it's one thing for you or other public health physicians to identify a problem, and it's quite another thing for the people of that country to accept it, understand it, and be willing to do something about it. When we first published the first paper, which was an observation that we made in a very large study, that children who were vitamin A deficient were dying at considerably higher rates than their controls who were less deficient. All kids were deficient in Indonesia where this was done, but it was, a, this, and it was this dose response relationship. The more deficient you were, the more likely you were to die. Nobody in the scientific community believed it. So there was not a single letter to the editor. Uh, so the first job we had was in fact convincing our colleagues in the uh, public health research community, the nutrition community, infectious disease community, pediatric community, that this was really real. So we had spent about two years and probably a couple million dollars preparing the field site for the intervention program, terrific local people who we recruited to staff the project. Um, we got through Marcos regime having fallen, the new government absolutely supported, wanted us to go forward. And then uh, this was in an area called Albay province, which was a hotbed for guerrilla activity. Uh, and the guerrillas came to us, they wanted our maps because we census the areas, we know where everybody is. And we said, no, we can't give you the maps because that would put people's life in danger. The army came, they wanted our maps. We said, no, we can't give you the maps, that would put our people in danger. They both accepted that. The day before we actually began the formal study where people visited houses and gave out vitamin A and so forth. We had done 
one practice round and one of the members of this communist movement who turned out to have been a physician who was denied a residency visa in the United States got on the ra local radio and said that this is an imperial plot. Americans are here to kill Filipino children, the usual sort of rubbish, and the study was gone like that. I mean, there's no way. We need close to 95% uh, compliance, cooperation with the population. In the Philippines, anybody can buy airtime and say anything they want to do. There's no way we're going to get that back. But see, you're raising an interesting question, because if, if somebody uh, made a breakthrough of this magnitude in this country, people very quickly, it seems to me, would be clamoring to be treated. Whereas over there, there was a lot of suspicion. tremendous resistance. Well, there was suspicion. And people will use that to their political advantage. Actually, the way we overcame, overcame the scientific uh, disagreements was simply by saying, we're not getting up on a soapbox. We're not going to write argumentative and competing letters to the editor. Once you convert the scientific, you know, the science community, what happens? Well, that's very interesting. Um, two, two things actually happened. Uh, one is it was a lot easier then to get WHO uh, behind the program. UNICEF, in a way, was behind the program earlier than the conversion of the entire community because Jim Grant, who was a very effective director of UNICEF, died a few years ago, um, and was always looking for magic bullets that would be inexpensive, simple uh, programs that could make a dramatic impact on children's health. The political process is a critical one in public health, any public health issue, even one which is non-controversial as vitamin A. It's not touching on anybody's gender. It's not touching on anybody's um, religious beliefs, uh, it's not changing any cultural patterns, even something as neutral uh, as vitamin A did have to go through a political process. But you, you talk about a political process. See, I would characterize it in different terms. I would say that what you did on vitamin A was a simple solution to an, an enormous problem and took a Herculean effort to sell it to people who are suffering from the problem and the job's not done. What does that say about what you're up against on issues of public health in the developing world? Uh, well, you know, you look at HIV and you look about those are truly politicized processes. It, it's, it's difficult because you're asking countries who have a very different belief system. Now, on the average minister of health in Africa knows as much as I do about public health. You go down to the community level, we go into, into areas to do whatever studies we're doing, whether it's vitamin A or it's malaria research or vaccine trials, what have you, and we always go through the process of real informed consent, at least as much as you can. We always set up, many countries uh, have never done randomized trials before, don't know anything about informed consent, so we actually build institutions. We build uh, institutional review boards in countries so that they can make an informed decision about whether the country wants to participate in this research project and then how to explain this to the people who are actually participating. So you, you can imagine you go to a rural area of almost any poor country in the world, most of the people are illiterate, they have a totally different belief system as our ancestors did before a hundred years ago and that diseases are spirits or um, decisions by God. Is there a public of, education component to what you do? There's always a public education. You just have to educate people in order to get them, first at the government level, Ministry of Health level, to get them to agree that this is an issue that they have, that they're facing, and that this may be a solution and something that they want to participate on. The scientists in the countries are smart, well-educated, they're never an issue. Their problem, however, is they often can't convince their minister of health. It often takes a foreigner. And what, the foreigner can be from the next country, but it often takes a foreigner because people won't believe the experts in their own country. Then once you've done the study, of course, then you come up with this very difficult problem. These are 
These are resource-poor countries. I remember when I first got interested in vitamin A, and, and initially entirely from the perspective of blindness and visual impairment, and we already had plenty of evidence that it was an important problem that half a million children were going blind a year, 10 million children had other evidence, eye evidence of vitamin A deficiency. Do these people understand how much blindness, just to use one example, costs them uh, annually? It costs one dollar per dally, in which you say, whereas treating child leukemia costs two $250 or $2,500. The problem is, is that in a country where you've got lots of kids, they're considered replaceable. I mean, people love their children, they're heart sick when a child dies, but from an economic perspective, if you talk to any economist about what is the value of an infant in economic terms, it's minuscule. The resources that are made available in, in developing countries for this kind of work must be minuscule. Well, the, in absolute terms, the, the money is minuscule, but in relative terms, that is spending on health, which means predominantly public health, is proportionally much greater than it is, say, in the United States and developed world. Because originally, uh, just in the early post-colonial era, these countries wanted to be just like the U.S. and Europe. How involved is the Agency for International Development in this, these kinds of programs? The Agency for International Development is one of the most significant funders of uh, public health research and public health uh, interventions in the developing world. Uh, personally, I'll tell you, when uh, I first dreamt up this vitamin A and blindness, let alone this vitamin A mortality, um, the only reason it got funded, and it was originally funded by USAID, was because the fellow who was then the director of the Office of Health and Nutrition was a believer. And they had a National Academy of Science Committee review my project proposal, and they said, it's hopelessly complex and ambitious. It'll never be carried out. Vitamin A by itself can't possibly have a significant impact on children's lives when they live in such an impoverished environment. Do you see um, medical research and intervention in the world as an effective sort of tool of American foreign policy? In a broader context, if we improve health in the world, we're improving our own health at the same time. Well, let's talk about smallpox. You've been very outspoken about um, the need to destroy the smallpox vi viruses that are being held right. by the U.S. Talk about that. Had people known what they know now, I th think there's no question that everyone would have agreed to get rid of the smallpox virus a year or two after the last case occurred. The, the argument for keeping it for four or five years was we're not sure there aren't some cases hibernating in the Amazon jungle or something, so we better keep this thing around just in case something funny happens and we need to do some research on it. You know, there's just something <clears throat> a little goofy about a situation where a government works to eradicate an illness and then keeps it alive, the virus of the illness. I think it's real goofy. Um, but governments have, you know, multiple objectives. One of them is warfare, and one of them is peace, and one of them is health, and sometimes they get them confused. I think we've agreed that public health is a lot more than science. No. If you're going to make a change, it is a lot more than science. It's, and it's, that's really what distinguishes it in many ways from um, medical care research. So I'm an ophthalmologist. So we, somebody develops a better cataract technique, bam, it's out there. Public health is always a publicly, almost always, a publicly funded intervention and therefore requires resources and therefore gets caught up in the political mill. And smallpox and things like that get caught up in others, military mills, defense mills, all kinds of things. It doesn't affect the delivery of medical care per se, and that's why medical care is a a more direct response from research to application. Public health gets, by definition, into the political process.